Well, this morning we bring to a close our sermon series called Saved. And I kind of want to tell you where we're going to go over the next few weeks. Uh, starting next Sunday morning, I'm going to begin a series called Finding Peace in the Savior. And it's going to be somewhat of a topical study, but we're going to look at some things. Uh, starting next week, we're going to answer two questions. And those questions are, what does it mean to be anxious and the second question is, why should I not be anxious? And in the next week, as we begin to turn our eyes towards Thanksgiving, uh, the four musts to knowing peace, uh, knowing God's peace, and we'll look at that specifically, particularly looking at being grateful in the midst of all that goes on around us. And then the last Sunday in November, the 29th, pointing towards, yes, the Christmas season. In case you guys didn't know that, it will be here not long, guys. I hope that you've gotten all your Christmas shopping done or at least begin thinking about your Christmas shopping, right? Amen. Somebody said amen. You must not have done anything. <laughs> but it is what it is. But we're going to be looking at dealing with the anxiousness that comes in relationships. And I don't know about you, but when Christmas time starts, that's when you're around all the crazy people, right? Amen? That's when I show up. That's what my family says about me. But, but yes, today we're going to bring our series saved to an end. And over the course of the last few weeks, we've answered quite a few questions. I've presented some questions to you. The first question that we looked at several weeks ago was, why do we need to be saved? And we looked at the scripture, and the reason that we need to be saved is that we were dead. We were disobedient. We were dominated, and we were doomed because of our sin and our trespasses. And that's the pretty dark, the bleak side of, of all of that is that we are just those things. But we get to verse 4 of chapter 2 and it says, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, only God can save us. And he's done that perfectly and securely through Jesus Christ. And last week we talked about what does it mean to be saved? What do we get from being saved and we saw that he loved us he made us alive together with Christ he raised us up with Christ he seated us with Christ in the heavenly places now I want us to answer a final question what now because of all the things that we've studied all the things that we looked at what now because I don't want you to say or just say you're saved and you go and you walk away and you go well I'm saved but but I've got a lot of years left on this earth. Now what? What do I do with all of these things? And you and I need to understand that our lives count. Our lives matter. And today I want us to answer the question, what are we saved for? That's the question I want us to look at today. What are we saved for? And we're going to look specifically at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. So let's jump in this morning. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of work, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now again here, Paul, he says a phrase that we've already heard once in our passage here. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. This is the gift of God, not as a result of what? Works. Works. Not, not, not works. So that no one may boast is what the scripture says. Now we like to use the word faith. In our vocabulary, even in our, our cultural vocabulary, we use that word faith quite a bit. And sometimes when we use the word faith, it can even sometimes make us sound spiritual. I hear people say quite a bit, you've just got to have faith. And I've always wondered, what do they really mean by that? What does that really mean when somebody says, you just got to have faith? Well, does it mean that there is a spiritual force that you and I, we can manipulate on a day-to-day -day basis? Discerning between good and evil? Well, that sounds a whole lot like a Star Wars movie or Jedi mind tricks. Nothing against Star Wars, am I? But that's the way it is. Does it mean it's a, a magical ending? 
to a situation in which we can close the story down by wrapping a nice little bow at the end of the story. Well, that sounds a whole lot like a Hallmark movie, right? Guys, I'm so sorry that I picked on your Hallmark movies. I know you were so in tune to the Hallmark movies this time of year. Channel 312, DirecTV. That's all I got to say. <laughs> I'm going to leave that one alone. Because <laughs> I'm going to tell off on myself if I do that. Yeah, I'll go ahead and tell it. <laughs> you know what one of my favorite shows is? I'm going to get in trouble for this. I love Golden Girls. <laughs> <laughs> And it comes on Hallmark Channel, like from 9 o'clock to midnight, in case you didn't know that. And right now, it's not on because those stinking Christmas movies are on from Hallmark Channel. Yeah. So every night when my kids say, I got to go check on my girls, that's what I'm talking about. I'm going to watch my my TV. Because you know why? Because I remember watching it with my grandmother. And that's why the memories come back. But it's awful. It's absolutely awful. Back to faith. Does it mean that something or someone is going to to come through for us only to result in an outcome that works for our best interest? Is that what faith is? Because that sounds a whole lot like politics. For a Christian, faith is something so much different, so much different. Faith is not some magical charm that makes us happy in this life. Faith is not a, a pithy statement that we use that when we're scared to death, And we want everybody to think, hey, it's just okay. Faith, listen to me, faith is the confidence in the one true God who never changes. He never changes and has our best interests in mind even when it does not go our way. Faith is being confident in the one who has proven himself over and over and over to do the right thing. Faith is trusting even when we don't understand. But it's even more than that. We see that in our text this morning. And here's something I want to tell you and I want you to think about. But follow me, okay? Faith does not save us. What does the text say? For by what you're saved? By grace you're saved. We are saved only by the grace of God through Jesus. We are saved because of grace which is attained by and through faith. Think about it this way. Think of it like a syringe that is filled with medication. The syringe does not heal you. The medication is what heals you. The syringe is just the tool that gets the medication to you. And in the same way, faith is the syringe in which we receive the medication of grace that saves us. The only thing a person can do that will have any part in salvation is to exercise that faith in what Jesus has already done for us. The only thing that we bring to our salvation is the sin that is our death sentence. There is no sweat equity in our salvation because we didn't earn it. But here, Paul takes it even a step further as he emphasizes that even faith is not from us apart from God giving it to us. That's why he says in verse 8, and this is not your own doing. This there means salvation by grace through faith. I love what John MacArthur says here. He says, when a person chokes or drowns and stops breathing, there is nothing he can do. If he ever breathes again, it will be because someone else starts him breathing. A person who is spiritually dead, and, and all of us are or once were, cannot even make a decision of faith unless God first breathes into him the breath of spiritual life. Faith is simply breathing the breath that God's grace supplies. Yet, the paradox is that we must exercise it and bear the responsibility if we do not. You see, salvation does not originate with us. It is the gift of God, as Scripture tells us. If a gift is earned, it ceases to be a gift at that point. That's why Paul continues, not as a result of work so that no one may boast. Because salvation is not dependent upon good works. Nobody can boast. Therefore, truly, it is a gift for you and for me. Therefore, all boasting boasting is eliminated in salvation. That's why when I hear someone who is boastful and who is arrogant, it's to me a pretty good indication that that person's not saved. 
Because you know why? Someone who is saved understands that they were dead in their trespasses and sin. And there is no longer part of their vocabulary anymore. Our hope, friends, is not based on wishful thankful or our worthiness, but our on God's gracious work in Jesus Christ. And that's why Paul, he spent all of that time that we looked at in chapter 1 of Ephesians helping us understand our identity in Christ. In Christ, we are secure in our eternal status and our earthly condition that spurs us to something much larger than ourselves. What do I mean by that? Well, Paul continues on here to say, for we are his workmanship. This means that he is working in us, he is working on us, and he is working through us. We are his workmanship. We are created in Christ Jesus. There's our identity that we've been talking about. And that word created that we see there in verse 10 may be overlooked in this passage, but it's so, so vitally important to to spend some time thinking about that word created for just a moment. When you see the word created in the New Testament, it is exclusively used to convey the idea of creating that is done exclusively by God. So what is he creating? In salvation, we are being created into the image of Jesus. We are a new creation, Scripture tells us. And the same power that created us in Christ will empower us to do good works, to be his workmanship. So what Paul is not doing here, he's not showing the original audience and you and I today how to be saved, but how we were saved in the essence. In order to convince us that the power that saved us is the same power that keeps us each and every day. We are created for good works, friends. Salvation does not lead us to complacency or passivity. It's not a check the box, one and done, and you're out of here. That's not what salvation is all about. I really don't like the Hallmark movies, but another show that I do like, and you may like it, is American Pickers. You've seen that show? If it wasn't for the DVR, I would never get to see it, but unless I get to see it. And if you've never watched American Pickers, it's basically two dudes driving around the country in a van digging through people's junk. That's what it is. Why I'm excited about that, I don't know. But it's the thrill of the hunt, finding something maybe that somebody else has discarded and going in, a lot of times they find stuff that is pure D junk is what it is. But for them, they make money off of it. They sell it. But every once in a while, as they're digging through somebody else's junk, they'll go to a barn or they'll go to a garage. And they'll find an old car or an old motorcycle. And it's one of those things that was bought but just parked in a garage. It will be low mileage and good shape and everything else. And those are the kind of finds that you really want to find. And they'll buy those things and they'll make tons of money off those things. But when I see that, I scratch my head a lot of times. Because sometimes people will buy a a car that's valuable or a motorcycle that's valuable to to, to the current day. And they'll buy that and they'll, they'll drive it home and then they'll stick it in a garage. And then it just sits there. For years and years and years. You see, those cars and those motorcycles were not made to just sit in a garage. That motorcycle, that Harley Davidson was not made to just sit in a garage. It's made to ride on the open road, right? It's made to to, to ride. Those cars are made to drive. And it's a shame that those things just sit in a garage. Friends, we weren't saved just to sit in a garage. We were saved to be God's workmanship. And through his grace, we carry on those good works. And as followers of Jesus, we are commanded to live holy lives. Both the desire and the availability to to do so come from a relationship with the living God who breathes new life into those who are spiritually dead, the scripture says. But before we can do any good work for the Lord, he has to do a good work in us first. Receiving this gift that Paul talks about means living with and for Jesus in a brand new way. Good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them, verse 10 says. Now, if you've grown up particularly in in a Baptist tradition, you know, we've always been told, you know, 
works are not part of salvation. You, good works can't get you into heaven and all those things. No works, no works, no works, no works. Then we get here and it says works. Whoa. Your mind just kind of goes, it explodes a little bit. You see, the key for a follower of Jesus is to get the works in the right order. There is an order to all of this. Jesus works save us. He works in us as his workmanship and then begins to work through us. So our works are the result of his works. Unlike religion and spirituality and morality that teaches, here are your works and those things will save you. No, Jesus says you are saved by my works. You are saved by my works. He works in you, he works on you, and he works through you to do good works that culminate, listen to me, that culminate into acts of worship. Those works become worship. So now as we have kind of walked verse by verse theologically through those first, these last few verses here, I want us to land the plane to this series. And I want to say seven things about good works this morning and what we are saved for. You ready? Here we go. First is this. All works by God's grace for God's glory are good works. Moms, some of you may be past this or some of you may be going through this. You get woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning. Your child is screaming or crying again. And you get up. And at that very moment, you kind of like, I hate my life, right? You want to go to sleep. I know it. It's a good work if you're doing it for the glory of God. It's a good work if you're doing it for the glory of God by the power of God's grace. All work done unto the Lord is good work. It's good. God has things for you to do. God has things for me to do. Your meaning and your life and your value and your purpose is all empowered by God's grace. And here's what I want to teach you this morning. It's not that we're saved by works, but rather we are empowered by grace to do good works. So works and grace are not actually working against each other. God's grace forgives our sin. God's grace also empowers us to do those good works. So you can do good works by the grace of God to the glory of God. Paul even says it in another way in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 10. And it sounds a little bit arrogant when he says it. He says, basically, I've worked harder and I get more done than anyone. And it sounds a little bit arrogant until he says, by the grace of God, that was with me. Paul says, by the grace of God, I was able to do the good works that God prepared in advance for me to do. So God's grace empowers you and I to do good works. And any work and all work by God's grace for God's glory are good works. Second is this. God is calling us all to good works. Most of Jesus' good works were as a carpenter. You ever thought about that way? Not as a preacher. As a kid, obeying his parents, learning to read and to write, doing his chores, those were the good works that were prepared in advance for him to do, including walking to the well and getting some water for his family. Those were the good works prepared in advance. Then, we know that he worked as a carpenter with his dad, and those were obviously good works. Then he started preaching, and those were good works. And some people wrongly think that Jesus' ministry didn't actually start until he started preaching, but it's just the opposite. His whole life was an act of worship to God's glory. So let me ease your mind a little bit. God isn't calling all of us in this room to be missionaries. God isn't calling all of us to be Deacons, God isn't calling all of us to be pastors and teachers, but God is calling us all to good works. He's calling us all. For some of you, that's an accountant, being an accountant. For some of you, it's being a, a school teacher. For some of you, it's being a mother. For some of you, it's being a father. For some of you, it's being a, a landscaper. Some of you, it's being a, a banker. Some of you, it's for being a nurse. And some of you, it's just being a real estate agent. God is calling us all to good works. And it's not as if there is a higher calling or a lower calling when it comes to God. The good works are all things that Jesus has laid out for us to do. And whatever those things are for you, those are the things that we should be doing by the grace of God. 
And I want to free you up from this pressure of thinking that there's a varsity and there's a junior varsity in the kingdom of God. It's not true. Just because I'm paid in ministry, that doesn't mean I'm, I'm, I'm doing good works that a farmer can't do, right? Our teacher can't be doing. is something other than the equality of good works. We can all do good works. You see that? Do whatever it is God's appointed for you to do for his glory. God is calling us all to good works. Number three, there's no such thing as sacred or secular work for Christians. I hear people say all the time, well, I have a, I have a especially when we come to church, I have a secular job. No, you don't. That's not true. If you love Jesus, it's a worshipful job. Whatever you are doing. That's why Paul says, whatever you do, you do it for the glory of God. You know what we need? Yeah, we, we need deacons, but we also need accountants in this world. Yes, we need pastors, but we also need honest real estate brokers in this world. We need all of those things. You are needed. And I really want you to know that what you're doing is sacred, not just because you're doing sacred things, but because Jesus is with you. And because Jesus is with you, it's now an act of worship, which makes even yes Stapling, filing, driving the kids to baseball practice, all those things are sacred thing. There's no such thing as sacred and secular work for Christians. Number four, some of you need to discover the good works God has set before you. Maybe it's today you need to learn to say no to some things. Some of you need to spend some time praying about, thinking about, considering, getting some counsel about some things in your life. Okay, God, what are the things that you want me to do and how can I prepare myself for those things? Maybe the good work is I want to be an astronaut. That was never my choosing, but it may be yours. Okay, how do you get ready for that? Some of you, maybe I want to be a parent. Okay, well, how do we get ready for that? I want to, I want to start a company. Okay, well, how do we get ready for that? I, I, want to, I just want to be a good employee. Okay, how do, how do we do that? How do we get prepared for that? I, maybe I want to finish my education. Okay, how can you do that? You've got to ask yourself, in this next season, God, what is it that you have for me? And let me tell you this. Sometimes, particularly with younger people, we get way too far down the road and we start thinking about what we're going to do in the next 60 years when we really need to think about what we're going to do the next 60 minutes. Do the little things that point you to the big things. You hear me? Do the little things that point you to the big things. Start with those good works and then God will begin to direct you towards whatever that good works are that ensue after that. But some of you maybe need to take some time this week and really think through that. Think about that. Okay, what are the good works God has prepared for me? And maybe sometimes that starts with an internal desire, some things that you like to do. Maybe you say, well, I really like to work with high school kids. Or maybe I, I, I really like to work in women's ministry. Maybe it's I, I really like to serve the poor. Whatever it is, God lays a desire in your heart and you say, maybe that's the beginning of the good works that he's called me to do. So some of you need to discover the good works that God has set before you. Number five, some of you need to infuse your current works with grace. What do I mean by that? Some of you may be here this morning, you're thinking, well, I, if I just had a, a new spouse. Well, maybe it's not the new spouse that you need. Maybe it's that you need to bring grace, the grace of God in your relationship with your spouse. Or maybe you're thinking, if only my children would just listen to what I'm trying to tell them. Well, maybe you might need to infuse grace into your relationship with your children. It might not be that you need to quit your job to find yourself. I always wondered, those people that go to find themselves, what happens when they do find themselves? I don't know. You tell me when you find that out, when you find yourself. But maybe, maybe you just need to bring Jesus to your work and you ask the question, well, how can I infuse the grace of God with the job that I already have? To love the boss that's driving me crazy. To sit in the cubicle that drives me nuts next to that person who is driving me absolutely insane. 
None of y'all have co-workers like that, do you? How can I love and serve here now without a funky attitude to love God and to love people that are around me? And sometimes I hear people say it. Yeah, it's, it's hard work. It must not be the will of God. It must not be the desire of God. Friends, we worship a guy who was murdered. You hear me? It might be really hard. But how do you infuse that which is hard with the grace of God? Some of you need to infuse your current works with grace. Number six, we're not saved by our works, but we are saved to our works. Hopefully that's pretty simple for you to understand. But see, religion says you're saved by your works. Jesus, on the other hand, on the other hand teaches and he also demonstrates that we're not saved by our works. We're saved to our works. They're not the root of our faith. They are the fruit of our faith. There's a difference there. They're not what brings us into a relationship with God. They're what comes out of those who are in a relationship with God already. And you hear people say all the time, well, you can't judge me. And you're right, we can't judge me, but we should always remember there is a judgment coming. But we can inspect. And I think we should inspect, not only in our own heart, but those who are around us. What is in the heart always comes out. It always comes out. We live our lives out of the overflow of a relationship with Jesus. If there is not a relationship with Jesus, we can just go through the motions, but then those works become dry and they we become really disengaged. The good works, though, it's loving your neighbors. It's the simple things. It's being generous in your life. It's caring. And when, when you bill someone for billable hours, you're honest about those things. All of that is good works. We are not saved by our works, but we are saved to our works. Number seven, God does not need our works, but our neighbor does. God does not need our works, but our neighbor does. You see, God doesn't need any school supplies. But the kid without a dad, he needs school supplies. God doesn't need groceries, but the single mom may need some groceries. God doesn't need us to run an honorable company, but our neighbor needs us to run an honorable company. God doesn't need us to love our neighbor. Our neighbors need us to love our neighbors. And so the good works are not things that God needs. God can take care of himself. He's a big boy. These are things that our neighbors need, and it's a way of loving our neighbors and showing the love of Jesus what he has for you and for me. And we do that, not so that God would love us, but because he already has. Not so that we would come into a right relationship with God, but because we're already in a right relationship with him. Not so that God would be pleased with us, but because in Christ, he already is pleased with us. And it frees us to love and to serve people by the grace of God. So I ask you this morning, do you know Jesus? Do you love Jesus? Do you belong to Jesus? Are you in Christ? Are you saved? Let those sink in for just a moment. If not, this is where you give your life to Christ. At this moment, at this hour. That's what faith is, giving yourself and your sin and your whole life and your future to Jesus. And if you do know Christ here today, and you've been saved, and you have been rescued, I want you to know what you have been saved from. I want you to know what you are saved, who you're saved by, but also I want you to know what you're saved to. And as Scripture says, let us walk in them. Father, I thank you today that you save us, that you rescue us from death. Father, your word tells us that we were dead. All of us in this room at one time or another were dead. 
Father, for that person who's here who does not have a relationship with Jesus who is still spiritually dead, Father, I pray that today that you would do a work in their life to, to bring them to yourself so that they would know today that they need to be saved because they were doomed without a relationship with you for eternity. But that can all be made new because you are rich in mercy and love. And today we accept that gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. And Father, for my friends who are here today, may we understand with more clarity today that we are your workmanship. Lord, that you have created us to do good works. Not that we're saved by our works. You've already taken care of that. But we're saved to do good works. And Father, may that be the fruit of our life. And maybe today we need to examine our life and see where we need your grace to be infused in our everyday situations with our family, in our work environment, our school environment, wherever we find ourselves. And just because something is hard doesn't make it, doesn't make it invaluable. God, today I pray that you would do a work in our hearts and our life. Help us to recalibrate ourselves to you. Father, may your de desires be what our desires are. Father, that you would change us from the inside out. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, if you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you've never come to that point in your life where you've trusted him with your life. My prayer is that today, while we sing our hymn of response here in just a moment, I want to be standing right down on the front. And if you've never trusted Christ with your life, I want to, I want to encourage you to step out and come and take me by the hand and say, Pastor, I want to give my life to Jesus and allow me the opportunity and privilege to be able to share with you how you do that. But maybe you're here today and God has spoken to your heart and God has showed you some areas of your life where you need to infuse his grace, but you need his help. And I want to encourage you and challenge you to come and put those things on the altar today. Or maybe you would even like for me to, to pray for you in those difficult situations. I'd be honored to be able to do that this morning. But as we have approached God's word, as we have opened God's word, and whenever we do that, it always demands a response. We can't leave here the same people. We've got to be changed, and we need to come to a response. So as we stand together and sing, you make that response known today.